Uh, let me add my thanks to the people who invited us here. It's very nice to have such a very wide range of topics to listen to, so many new things to, to become familiar with. Um, uh, yes, I'm from the University of Glasgow, and uh, let me put up a little bit of advertising for the university. This is the, this is the main university building, and this, gentl oh. this gentleman, of course, is Lord Kelvin. Um, of course, that's where our temperature scale comes from. This horrible-looking building here, of course, is physics, also known as the Kelvin Building. And this, maybe not quite, this is, this is down below the main university building there. This is the river Kelvin. So, in fact, Kelvin was William Thompson. He took the name Kelvin because of the Kelvin. So our temperature scale is named after this river, which I think is rather nice. It's, it, and and uh, m most of the times of the year, it's quite appropriate to be thinking in terms of this thing, in terms of Kelvins, because it's pretty cold. So, um, yes, unusual representations. Uh, I was trying to think of something which would be suitable for a general audience. Um, and so what I'm going to do is show you two ways in which we can represent black body radiation, which perhaps you may not have come across before. And both of them are motivated by trying to change or represent the black body radiation in terms of a vacuum state, not in terms of some mixed density operator or photon number distribution or whatever else you might think of. So that's the thing to, that's the thing to keep in mind. We're talking about a mathematical representation in which the thermal averages appear as vacuum expectation values, which is useful perhaps in quantum, quantum field theory. So the, um, the first technique is one called thermofields. And uh, just to uh, give a little bit of a uh, um, uh, motivator, one of the ideas that essentially you may recognize within this is something to do with Hawking radiation. I'm not talking about black holes or even accelerating the radiation or anything like that but there is a mathematical link. And you can use that to describe thermal bosons and fermions and dynamics. And I'll give you an example of how to use that, this formalism in something simple, which is a photon counting experiment on black body radiation. And then the, the second part, if I get that far, is something which I, I think, think I, it's best to call the vacuum picture. And I rather like this. Um, I'm not sure what to use it for yet, because it's new. So maybe some of you have some ideas about what to do with it. But what I like about it is, philosophically, as you'll see, it's actually, I, I, no, it is. It's the precise, it's the exact opposite of Planck's original idea of what black body radiation is. And you'll see, see why that's the case. Um, let me emphasize, these are not approximations. These are exact representations, so they can be used in place. Uh, let's see. Okay, so thermofields. Thermofield st uh, started with uh, this gentleman, Hirumi Umetsawa, in the 1970s. You heard some of his, uh, some of his school. And to show you how it works, it's best to start with something really simple. Let's take an isolated quantum system, a harmonic oscillator, an atom, whatever is your favorite. And we know that in thermal equilibrium, equilibrium you can write down a mixed state, a density operator, which is essentially e to the minus p to h, and h is the Hamiltonian. And if you expand that out in terms of energy eigenstates, you get each energy weighted by this Boltzmann factor. Of course, we all know that. And the way it's used is if we have some property, A, then the, we can evaluate the, the average of that by taking the trace with rho, and it's then just this sum of uh, probabilities, if you like, of being in these excited, these uh, energy states, so, uh, sorry, these, these matrix elements weighted by that probability. So Umutsawa's um, observation was that you can represent that as an expectation value in a pure state. And the way you do that is you take, e for each state of your system, in this case, each energy eigenstate, you have a second system. So if it's a harmonic oscillator, you add a second harmonic oscillator. It's not physically there, but you just add it, and then represent the state in this way. If this is the square root, or one over the square root of the partition function, here are these two energy eigenstates, one for your system, one for the partner, and the square root of this Boltzmann factor. And then if you take the expectation value, what happens is the operator acts only on this space, and the orthogonality of these states kills off the off-divergence, and you get back to the same average. Um, and in fact, it's a simple trick. You can represent any 
uh, mixed state in this way as a pure state. And uh, of course, uh, when fields collide or don't collide, or when they miss each other, things are often reinvented, uh, as, in, as actually happened to those of you who know anything about quantum information theory. When it was rediscovered, I have to say rediscovered by that community, it was called purification. And that, the name has stuck, but it's an older idea. So, so what? Well, the, the, uh, the, what makes this a little bit more than a mathematical curiosity is that these states are related to the vacuum by a unitary transformation. So they're very simply, gosh, here we go. So of course, let's just take, uh, you can do it for this for bosons or for fermions, it doesn't matter, but let's just run down the boson example as we're talking about black body radiation. So this is the density operator that I'm trying to represent. And the, this state, this thermal vacuum state, is related to the two mode vacuums. So this is your um, physical boson, this is a different mode that you've created by this unitary transformation. And this uh, factor theta is related in this way to the temperature. And then the point is that if I want to evaluate some property, say of the A's and A daggers, in this state, so the thermal average, by undoing the transformation in this way, so A goes to cosh theta A plus sinh theta A dagger, and likewise for the, the A dagger, for, it turns into a vacuum expectation value. Now what's the link with Hawking radiation? Well, essentially, this is exactly the transformation that is associated in Hawking's calculation of Hawking radiation. Essentially, you've got a transformation of, an, of a asymptotically in the past, ingoing vacuum state, split into two modes. In this case, they're two physical modes. They're the one that you can see and the one that's trapped behind the event horizon, which you can't. And that's how it becomes a thermal mixed state. So it's exactly this transformation. Right. Um, let me show you how a, a, a very simple calculation works. So let's suppose that I want to work out for my mode the, um, some moment of the, of the um, occupation number. So for example, uh, n would be a dagger times a. This is the second factorial moment, so that's a, square, a dagger squared a squared, or if you like, n into n minus one. That's what turns up in photon counting and so on. Um, so you can evaluate it by doing that transformation. So I change that state into the double vacuum. Vacuum expectation values are nice and easy. And I change a dagger into cosh theta a dagger plus sinh theta a. And likewise, I change, make the, the change of a to cosh theta a plus sinh theta a dagger, raise them to that power. It's very easy to, do, to evaluate this now because, of course, the annihilation operator is acting to the right. Uh, it gives you nothing. The creation operator is acting to the left give you nothing, and you're just left with, oh, yes, you're just left with sinh to the m, two, sinh squared to the power m of theta, so one each of these sides of the power m, and then multiplied by this ex vacuum expectation value, which is just uh, m factorial. So there's your factorial moments. Of course, we could have calculated that any way we like, but that's just an, an, an illustration. And something which I want to pick up a little bit later, for example, if you want to look at the uh, mean square number of uh, number of bosons, uh, you can write that as this, uh, this second moment, n2 plus uh, n1, and that gives you that the uncertainty in the number of particles, of course, is given by this thermal, thermal value, which we know, the square of the mean plus uh, the mean. I say that will come up uh, later on. Uh, what about dynamics? So, of course, a lot of what we're interested in is the black body radiation or the environment interacting with a quantum system of interest. In fact, that's a unifying theme, shall we say, for this, this entire meeting. So if I'm going to describe that, I can do it also using this, this transformation. So here is something simple. This is just the free evolution of, uh, of, say, the annihilation operator for one of my field modes. All it does is it picks up an e to the minus i omega t like that. <clears throat> but I can rewrite it in terms of these uh, well, well, by, by doing the unity transformation. So I get, I can write that in terms of this, if you like, thermal annihilation operator times cosh theta and a thermal creation operator times sinh theta. Again, with the e to the minus i omega t variation. Now the fact that this, this object ev uh, evolves like e to the minus i omega t and a dagger also evolves like e to the minus i omega t tells you what the free Hamiltonian must look like. So for the first one, of course, it's just, a dagger A, just the normal uh, omega times the 
H bar omega multiplied by the number of particles, so it's just a normal harmonic oscillator. But here we've got the A dagger, which evolves like e to the minus i omega cube, the other way up. So that's an inverted oscillator. So your fictitious one looks like an inverted oscillator, um, and the original one looks like a regular oscillator. What does that do to dynamics? So let's suppose that we've got a spin or a, a two-level transition, maybe an atom inside a cavity, interacting with a single mode. So what we have is uh, this uh, interaction, which tells you that uh, you have two elementary processes. You can absorb a photon, sorry, you can emit a photon and uh, go from the excited state to the ground state, or you can absorb a photon and go from the ground state to the excited state. But if you do this transformation, so the, 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 this, you, this you could then use in a thermal environment, or you can transform it into, you now have two interacting terms. So this is a sort of scaled version of the one that you already had. This is the one that you get by coupling to the inverted oscillator. So now in this situation, for that second mode, you create a, photo, you create a virtual one of these particles, you create a particle at the same time as making a transition down because the oscillator is upside down. So you move, you, you move down a step. Um, so the sort of thing you might have is that if you start off, for example, in the excited state with this uh, thermal description, then the uh, interactions are, are essentially oscillate or, or alternate between these two. So from the excited state, you can create a particle um, and make a transition to the ground state. But from this state, of course, you can go back or you can go from the ground state up to the excited state again emitting one of these inverted oscillator particles, and so on, and just move up and down, up the, uh, up the, uh, um, the ladder, if you like, like that. Um, I think this one, I think this one I shall, I shall skip. Um, the primary motivation for this approach wasn't to do with single discrete modes. That's easy. It's really to do with fields when you have a continuum. And the problem that you have with fields is you, you can't write down a density operator for them. The thing is, it's got an infinite number of modes, it's got an infinite renormalization constant, and so on. And so you tend to just, you, you either rediscretize or you wave the problem under the carpet or you do something else. Or you get to a density of states and do an integral as fast as you can and don't put an infinite. But here, you have a situation where you can turn a thermal problem into a, into a vacuum problem. And in field theory, we love vacuum expectation vacuum. So that's essentially the idea. So this is the, con this is the continuum version, if you like, of, the, of what I've just described. Now we have continuum creation operators and annihilation operators with delta function, co delta function commutation rules. <clears throat> and for this state, if I take the expectation value uh, of this uh, quantity, so I now have uh, um, a dagger and A evaluated at different frequencies, I get this sine squared factor and, of course, a delta function um, arising from the commutation relation of these two. So here's a very simple problem which we, which we all know about. Let's suppose that I have some black body like this and I look at the photo counts which I can, uh, can take from that. Um, and in fact, in particular, I'm going to be interested in uh, second order coherence, which we've heard about a little bit about already today. So we're interested in the situations uh, essentially where we get a photo detection event at two detectors from the field uh, at the same time. So the way we do this as a thermo fields calculation is, well, first of all, this is this, uh, we have to describe what we mean by um, uh, a, a, uh, a detection, detection. So essentially we, we have this sort of pulsed or timed combination of these frequency objects. So this F just simply describes um, the, uh, uh, well, the transform of this time profile, or if you like, the, the frequency, the frequency um, response of your detector or any filtering that goes on. You, you need that. You, your photo detector will not measure DC up to vacuum ultraviolet. Okay, so it has some kind of response. Um, and so this, this quantity, then the probability for, for, for detecting a, a, a particle or a photon at that time is just given by this expectation value. It's a trace of the density operator with a dagger of t and a of t or our vacuum expectation value. And again, we can do the same trick of the transformation. And, what, and when we do that, we find that it's the, here's our sine squared theta object. This is, this is the thermal piece. 
This is the modulus squared of the response of the, of the detector, um, and that gives you your average number. And if you're interested in the situation where the uh, question of joint detections at different times, well, that's okay. You just have the same structure, but with a dagger and A of T, and also uh, the number at, where is it, A dagger of T prime and A of T prime. And if you evaluate that, you get two contributions. One is the square of this, and the other one is a, essentially a cross-term interference term. And that tells you uh, what, ha what happens then depends on uh, this time interval compared to essentially the width of that function. So if this combination delta omega times the time difference is small, this combination turns into a two, which is the peak in your G2 function, which you uh, pick up at short times. And if it's in the opposite limit, it just goes back to one. Essentially, that's, that describes that curve. So particularly very simple. Um, change of tack. This is uh, something which I, I don't know how new it is, and I don't know what to use it for. Uh, it's something that came up in some discussions, but I thought I'd try it on some specialists and not so specialists and see if, see if it makes any sense. So, <clears throat> so the idea is that if I have a state of the field which is sufficiently classical, and, and let me just leave that hanging for the moment, but sufficiently close to something I could describe classically, um, then what I can do is I can write my field as exactly as a superposition of a classical field, a C number field, and the vacuum. And it's an, let me emphasize that, that it's exact. Um, so let's again go back to our single mode. Um, let's suppose, so I take a single mode um, field with some uh, position dependence and uh, one frequency, and here are my annihilation and creation operators. Um, so not, not thinking about um, thermal states just yet, I'm going to think instead of a coherent state. And for those of you who are new to coherent states, I can think of this as in one of two ways. I can think of this as something coherent uh, associated with a theorist's laser. Um, or, more precisely, this is what you would get if you had a classical current driving the field. So something which you could uh, drive in that way, like radio waves or something like that. Uh, and notice that it's unitarily related, so this unitary transformation, uh, to, the, to the vacuum state. So in the vacuum picture, what we do is we undo this. So I put the inverse transformation on, and again, you have a situation where the field is in the vacuum state. And if you do that, you have to do that to the states and also to the operators. And so your electric field turns into this electric field plus something which is described by a C number. And here it is. That's a superposition of the vacuum, electric, the vacuum field, an operator, and a classical field. So if you, want to, uh, if you want to describe thermal radiation in this way, all you have to do is, have a, is to treat that classical field as a stochastic, as a stochastic field with the right statistics. And in fact, what you need is this combination. This is the probability distribution on that, on that complex alpha, this object. Uh, and n bar is, is the mean number, of, mean number of photons. And then interesting things, at least to me, philosophically interesting things start happening. Remember, this is, this is an exact representation. It's an equi equivalence to any other form, uh, to a statement of the black body field that you like. But what it means is that if you think of the three elementary processes which, uh, which Einstein gave us in his 1917 paper, absorption, stimulated emission, and spontaneous emission, within this picture, absorption is driven by the classical part of the superposition of the fields, as is stimulated emission. And only spontaneous emission arises from interaction with the vacuum. I say it's an interpretation, but it's a, but it's a valid one. So you can really think of it in terms of two classical or semi-classical processes and one uh, quantum process, again, without approximation. Um, I said we come back to this. This is your, uh, if we do a um, photon counting statistics, the, uh, for, on our mode, the variance in the number of counts is n bar squared plus n bar. And um, the suggestion, this again comes from Einstein, is that we think of this object in terms of wave fluctuations. And this one is the shot noise or the, or the particle. So it's, it's some sort of early statement of wave particle duality. 
what does, the, what does the vacuum picture give you? So again, this is my total electric field, which I write as a superposition of a classical field, a C number field, and the vacuum. Now, of course, there isn't a photon number for the electric field. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alien concept. So you have to think a little bit. Um, and one way to go is, well, the energy goes like the square of the electric field. You know, it might be the volume integral or something like that, but essentially it goes like the square. And so what you could do is think of the fluctuations in the square of the, the total electric field. And when you do that, you get three contributions. You get the noise or the uncertainty associated with the square of the classical field. You get a cross term, which has got the average of the classical field and the, the square of the vacuum field. And of course, you then get, finally, the variance associated with this object. And what pops out is, well, some prefactors. This piece, the variance in the classical field, gives you n bar squared, which of course, yes, it is indeed wave fluctuations, because in this picture, it's a classical wave, a noisy one, which has produced this term. The, the n bar piece comes from, uh, if you like, interference. It's partly quantum, and it's partly classical. And those who here who are old enough, not many of you, to remember days of squeeze light experiments and so on and homodyne detection. They'll know all about the interference between a classical field and the vacuum giving you shot noise. That's exactly what this is. And the last piece is just a remnant of the fact that, strictly speaking, to get correct photon counts, I have to do some ordering, which I haven't done, which would have get rid of this term. So, so this is something that has uh, been developed in the last few weeks with uh, a number of uh, insightful and entertaining exchanges across the Atlantic with this gentleman, that's Peter Maloney. Right. Uh, oh, one more thing. So, <clears throat> uh, what, is, is what, what can we do with this with black body radiation? Well, we have a superposition of the vacuum, which is the vacuum, and you, you just treat the vacuum in the normal way, and a classical field. And so, in a sense, all the properties and all the coherence properties of black body radiation are reduced to the properties of this classical field. Um, and all that is, because of the way we constructed, it's just a Gaussian, a Gaussian noisy process with a mean zero average and a correlation function, which, much to my surprise, you can work out exactly. That's what it is. So let me emphasize, this is a, this is a, a classical correlation of a stochastically varying classical variable and provides a precise, uh, um, representation of black body radiation. So why did I say that this is the exact opposite, at least, yes, exact plot opposite of uh, Planck's original idea? Um, you maybe all know, or maybe not, that um, it appears that Planck's original idea was that the discretization in the uh, spectrum came not for the field, but from the emitters. So essentially, we, in modern language, he was thinking about a quantum structure in the, in the surface of your black body of radiation, radiating into the classical field. That was the original conception. What we've got here is the other way around. We've got a quantized vacuum field driven by a lot of classical currents with the right statistics. Actually, I think in, in that sense, it's rather the, the flip side of what, uh, what Planck proposed. So I think that's pretty much all I want to say. So this is just two examples of different ways in which you can represent black body radiation. There's the thermo field description, which um, is rather old now. It's uh, back, in, back in the mid 1970s. Um, it, it has a, it has a um, thriving community in those working in condensed matter and quantum field theory, but still I think seems to be unexpected or new to those in, in our community. Um, and I've given a simple example of how you could use it. There are many more. And there's some papers here. The vacuum picture is a bit different. It's still a vacuum representation, but it's the idea of superposing a classical stochastic field on top of the vacuum. Um, and uh, essentially, it's an extension to thermal fields, of a, again, of a rather old idea due to, due to Mollo from, again, from the 1970s. And let me emphasize that both of these representations are completely exact. So you can use either of them if it's computationally convenient or if it's insightful. In term, instead of whatever your previous current representation is. And I think that's probably my time. Thank you very much.